The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter 15, The Scowl and Smile. Several days passed over the Seven Gables, heavily and drearily enough, in fact, not to attribute the whole gloom of sky and earth to the one inauspicious circumstance of Phoebe's departure, an easterly storm had set in and indefatigably applied itself to the task of making the black roof and walls of the old house look more cheerless than ever before. Yet was the outside not half so cheerless as the interior? Poor Clifford was cut off at once from all his scanty resources of enjoyment. Phoebe was not there, nor did the sunshine fall upon the floor. The garden, with its muddy walks and the chill, dripping foliage of its summer house, was an image to be shuddered at. Nothing flourished in the cold, moist, pitiless atmosphere, drifting with the brackish scud of sea breezes, except the moss along the joints of the shingle roof, and the great bunch of weeds that had lately been suffering from drought in the angle between the two front gables. As for Hepzibah, she seemed not merely possessed with the east wind, but to be, in her very person, only another phase of this grey and sullen spell of weather. The east wind itself, grim and disconsolate, in a rusty black silk gown, and with a turban of cloud wreaths on its head. The custom of the shop fell off, because a story got abroad that she soured her small beer and other damageable commodities by scowling on them. It is perhaps true that the public had something reasonably to complain of in her deportment, but towards Clifford she was neither ill-tempered nor unkind, nor felt less warmth of heart than always had it been possible to make it reach him. The inutility of her best efforts, however, palsied the poor old gentlewoman. She could do little else than sit silently in a corner of the room when the wet pear-tree branches sweeping across the small windows created a noonday dusk which Hepzibah unconsciously darkened with her woe-begone aspect. It was no fault of Hepzibah's. Everything, even the old chairs and tables that had known what weather was for three or four such lifetimes as her own, looked as damp and chill as if the present were their worst experience. The picture of the Puritan colonel shivered on the wall, the house itself shivered from every attic of its seven gables down to the great kitchen fireplace which served all the better as an emblem of the mansion's heart because, though built for warmth, it was now so comfortless and empty. Hepzibah attempted to enliven matters by a fire in the parlor, but the storm demon kept watch above and whenever a flame was kindled drove the smoke back again choking the chimney's sooty throat with its own breath. Nevertheless, during four days of this miserable storm, Clifford wrapped himself in an old cloak and occupied his customary chair. On the morning of the 5th, when summoned to breakfast, he responded only by a broken-hearted murmur, expressive of a determination not to leave his bed. His sister made no attempt to change his purpose. In fact, entirely as she loved him, Hepzibah could hardly have borne any longer the wretched duty so impracticable by her few and rigid faculties of seeking pastime for a still sensitive but ruined mind, critical and fastidious, without force of volition. It was at least something short of positive despair that, today, she might sit shivering alone and not suffer continually a new grief and unreasonable pang of remorse at every fitful sigh of her fellow sufferer. But Clifford, it seemed, though he did not make his appearance below stairs, had, after all, bestirred himself in quest of amusement. In the course of the forenoon, Hepzibah heard a note of music which, there being no other tuneful contrivance in the House of the Seven Gables, she knew must proceed from Alice Pynchon's harpsichord. She was aware that Clifford, in his youth, had possessed a cultivated taste for music and a considerable degree of skill in its practice. It was difficult, however, to conceive of his retaining an accomplishment to which daily exercise is so essential in the measure indicated by the sweet, airy, and delicate, though most melancholy strain that now stole upon her ear. Nor was it less marvelous that the long, silent instrument should be capable of so much melody. Hepzibah involuntarily thought of the ghostly harmonies prelusive of death in the family which were attributed to the legendary Alice, but it was, perhaps, proof of the agency of other than spiritual fingers that, after a few touches, the chords seemed to snap asunder with their own vibrations, 
and the music ceased. But a harsher sound succeeded to the mysterious notes, nor was the easterly day fated to pass without an event sufficient in itself to poison, for Hepzibah and Clifford, the balmiest air that ever brought the hummingbirds along with it. The final echoes of Alice Pynchon's performance, or Clifford's, if his we must consider it, were driven away by no less vulgar a dissonance than the ringing of the shop bell. A foot was heard scraping itself on the threshold, and thence somewhat ponderously stepping on the floor. Hepzibah delayed a moment while muffling herself in a faded shawl, which had been her defensive armor in a forty years' warfare against the east wind. A characteristic sound, however, neither a cough nor a hem, but a kind of rumbling and reverberating spasm in somebody's capacious depth of a chest, impelled her to hurry forward with that aspect of fierce faint-heartedness so common to women in cases of perilous emergency. Few of her sex on such occasions have ever looked so terrible as our poor scowling Hepzibah, but the visitor quietly closed the shop door behind him, stood up his umbrella against the counter, and turned a visage of composed benignity to meet the alarm and anger which his appearance had excited. Hepzibah's presentiment had not deceived her. It was no other than Judge Pynchon, who, after in vain trying the front door, had now effected his entrance into the shop. "'How do you do, Cousin Hepzibah? "'And how does this most inclement weather affect our poor Clifford?' began the judge." and wonderful it seemed indeed that the easterly storm was not put to shame or at any rate a little mollified by the genial benevolence of his smile i could not rest without calling to ask once more whether i can in any manner promote his comfort or your own you can do nothing said hepzibah controlling her agitation as well she could i devote myself to clifford he has every comfort which his situation admits of "'But allow me to suggest, dear cousin,' rejoined the judge. "'You err in all affection and kindness, no doubt, and with the very best intentions, "'but you do err, nevertheless, in keeping your brother so secluded. "'Why insulate him thus from all sympathy and kindness? "'Clifford, alas, has had too much of solitude. "'Now let him try society, the society, that is to say, of kindred and old friends.' "'Let me, for instance, but see Clifford, "'and I will answer for the good effect of the interview.' "'You cannot see him,' answered Hepzibah. "'Clifford has kept his bed since yesterday.' "'What? How? Is he ill?' exclaimed Judge Pynchon, "'starting with what seemed to be angry alarm, "'for the very frown of the old Puritan darkened through the room as he spoke. "'Nay, then, I must and will see him. "'What if he should die?' "'He is in no danger of death,' said Hepzibah, "'and added with bitterness that she could repress no longer. "'None, unless he shall be persecuted to death now "'by the same man who long ago attempted it.' "'Cousin Hepzibah,' said the judge, "'with an impressive earnestness of manner "'which grew even to tearful pathos as he proceeded. "'Is it possible that you do not perceive how unjust?' How unkind, how unchristian is this constant, this long-continued bitterness against me for a part which I was constrained by duty and conscience, by the force of law, and at my own peril to act? What did I do in detriment to Clifford which it was possible to leave undone? How could you, his sister, if for your never-ending sorrow, as it has been for mine, you had known what I did, have shown greater tenderness? And do you think, cousin— "'that it has cost me no pang? "'That it has left no anguish in my bosom "'from that day to this amidst all the prosperity "'with which heaven has blessed me? "'Or that I do not now rejoice "'when it is deemed consistent with the dues of public justice "'and the welfare of society "'that this dear kinsman, this early friend, "'this nature so delicately and beautifully constituted, "'so unfortunate, let us pronounce him "'and forbear to say so guilty,' that our own Clifford, in fine, should be given back to life and its possibilities of enjoyment. Ah, you little know me, cousin Hepzibah. You little know this heart. It now throbs at the thought of meeting him. There lives not the human being except yourself, and you not more than I, who has shed so many tears for Clifford's calamity. You behold some of them now. 
There is none who would so delight to promote his happiness. Try me, Hepzibah. Try me, cousin. Try the man whom you have treated as your enemy and Clifford's. Try Jaffrey Pynchon, and you shall find him true to the heart's core. In the name of heaven, cried Hepzibah, provoked only to intenser indignation by this outgush of the inestimable tenderness of a stern nature. In God's name, whom you insult, and whose power I could almost question, since he hears you utter so many false words without palsying your tongue, give over, I beseech you, this loathsome pretense of affection for your victim. You hate him. Say so like a man. You cherish at this moment some black purpose against him in your heart. Speak it out at once, or if you hope so to promote it better, hide it till you can triumph in its success. But never speak again of your love for my poor brother. I cannot bear it. It will drive me beyond a woman's decency. It will drive me mad. Forbear. Not another word. It will make me spurn you. For once, Hepzibah's wrath had given her courage. She had spoken. But after all, was this unconquerable distrust of Judge Pynchon's integrity and this utter denial, apparently, of his claim to stand in the ring of human sympathies, were they founded in any just perception of his character or merely the offspring of a woman's unreasonable prejudice deduced from nothing? The judge, beyond all question, was a man of eminent respectability. The church acknowledged it. The state acknowledged it. It was denied by nobody. In all... The very extensive sphere of those who knew him, whether in his public or private capacities, there was not an individual except Hepzibah and some lawless mystic like the daguerreotypist and possibly a few political opponents who would have dreamed of seriously disputing his claim to a high and honorable place in the world's regard. Nor, we must do him the further justice to say, did Judge Pynchon himself probably entertain many or very frequent doubts that his enviable reputation accorded with his deserts. His conscience, therefore, usually considered the surest witness to a man's integrity, his conscience, unless it might be for the little space of five minutes in the twenty-four hours, or now and then some black day in the whole year's circle, his conscience bore an accordant testimony with the world's laudatory voice. And yet, strong as this evidence may seem to be, we should hesitate to peril our own conscience on the assertion that the judge and the consenting world were right, and that poor Hepzibah, with her solitary prejudice, was wrong, hidden from mankind, forgotten by himself, or buried so deeply under a sculptured and ornamented pile of ostentatious deeds that his daily life could take no note of it, there may have lurked some evil and unsightly thing. Nay, we could almost venture to say further that a daily guilt might have been acted by him, continually renewed and reddening forth afresh like the miraculous bloodstain of a murder without his necessarily and at every moment being aware of it. Men of strong minds, great force of character, and a hard texture of the sensibilities are very capable of falling into mistakes of this kind. They are ordinarily men to whom forms are of paramount importance, their field of action lies among the external phenomena of life. They possess vast ability in grasping and arranging and appropriating to themselves the big, heavy, solid unrealities such as gold, landed estate, offices of trust and emolument, and public honors. With these materials and with deeds of goodly aspect done in the public eye, an individual of this class builds up, as it were, a tall and stately edifice which, in the view of other people and ultimately in his own view, is no other than the man's character or the man himself. Behold, therefore, a palace. Its splendid halls and suites of spacious apartments are floored with a mosaic work of costly marbles. Its windows, the whole height of each room, admit the sunshine through the most transparent of plate glass. Its high cornices are gilded, and its ceilings gorgeously painted, and a lofty dome through which, from the central pavement, you may gaze up to the sky as with no obstructing medium between surmounts the whole. With what fairer and nobler emblem could any man desire to shadow forth his character? Ah, but in some low and obscure nook, some narrow closet on the ground floor, shut, locked, 
and bolted and the key flung away, or beneath the marble pavement in a stagnant water puddle with the richest pattern of mosaic work above, may lie a corpse, half decayed and still decaying and diffusing its death scent all through the palace. The inhabitant will not be conscious of it, for it has long been his daily breath. Neither will the visitors, for they smell only the rich odors which the master sedulously scatters through the palace, and the incense which they bring and delight to burn before him. Now and then, perchance, comes in a seer, before whose sadly gifted eye the whole structure melts into thin air, leaving only the hidden nook, the bolted closet, with the cobwebs festooned over its forgotten door, or the deadly hole under the pavement and the decaying corpse within. Here, then, we ought to seek the true emblem of the man's character and of the deed that gives whatever reality it possesses to his life. And beneath the show of a marble palace, that pool of stagnant water, foul with many impurities and perhaps tinged with blood, that secret abomination above which possibly he may say his prayers without remembering it, is this man's miserable soul. To apply this train of remark somewhat more closely to Judge Pynchon, we might say, without in the least imputing crime to a personage of his eminent respectability, that there was enough of splendid rubbish in his life to cover up and paralyze a more active and subtle conscience than the judge was ever troubled with. The purity of his judicial character while on the bench the faithfulness of his public servants in subsequent capacities, his devotedness to his party, and the rigid consistency with which he had adhered to its principles, or at all events, kept pace with its organized movements, his remarkable zeal as president of a Bible society, his unimpeachable integrity as a treasurer of a widow's and orphan's fund, his benefits to horticulture by producing too much esteemed varieties of the pear and to agriculture through the agency of the famous Pynchon Bull, the cleanliness of his moral deportment for a great many years past, the severity with which he had frowned upon and finally cast off an expensive and dissipated son, delaying forgiveness until within the final quarter of an hour of the young man's life, his prayers at morning and eventide, and graces at mealtime, his efforts in furtherance of the temperance cause, his confining himself since the last attack of the gout to five diurnal glasses of old sherry wine, the snowy whiteness of his linen, the polish of his boots, the handsomeness of his gold-headed cane, the square and roomy fashion of his coat and the fineness of its material, and, in general, the studied propriety of his dress and equipment, the scrupulousness with which he paid public notice in the street by a bow, a lifting of the hat, a nod or a motion of the hand to all and sundry his acquaintances, rich or poor, the smile of broad benevolence wherewith he made it a point to gladden the whole world. What room could possibly be found for darker traits in a portrait made up of lineaments like these? This proper face was what he beheld in the looking-glass. This admirably arranged life was what he was conscious of in the progress of every day. Then might not he claim to be its result in some and say to himself and the community, Behold Judge Pynchon there! And allowing that, many, many years ago, in his early and reckless youth, he had committed some one wrong act, or that even now the inevitable force of circumstances should occasionally make him do one questionable deed among a thousand praiseworthy, or at least blameless ones, would you characterize the judge by that one necessary deed, that half-forgotten act, and let it overshadow the fair aspect of a lifetime? What is there so ponderous in evil that a thumb's bigness of it should outweigh the mass of things not evil which were heaped into the other scale? This scale and balance system is a favorite one with people of Judge Pynchon's brotherhood. A hard, cold man, thus unfortunately situated, seldom or never looking inward, and resolutely taking his idea of himself from what purports to be his image as reflected in the mirror of public opinion, can scarcely arrive at true self-knowledge except through loss of property and reputation. Sickness will not always help him to it, not always the death hour. But our affair now is with 
Judge Pynchon, as he stood confronting the fierce outbreak of Hepzibah's wrath. Without premeditation, to her own surprise and indeed terror, she had given vent for once to the inveteracy of her resentment cherished against this kinsman for thirty years. Thus far, the judge's countenance had expressed mild forbearance, grave and almost gentle deprecation of his cousin's unbecoming violence, free and Christian-like forgiveness of the wrong inflicted by her words. But when those words were irrevocably spoken, his look assumed sternness, the sense of power and immitigable resolve, and this with so natural and imperceptible a change that it seemed as if the iron man had stood there from the first, and the meek man not at all. The effect was as when the light vapory clouds with their soft coloring suddenly vanish from the stony brow of a precipitous mountain and leave there the frown which you at once feel to be eternal. Hepzibah almost adopted the insane belief that it was her old Puritan ancestor and not the modern judge on whom she had been just wreaking the bitterness of her heart. Never did a man show stronger proof of the lineage attributed to him than Judge Pynchon at this crisis by his unmistakable resemblance to the picture in the inner room. "'Cousin Hepzibah,' said he very calmly, "'it is time to have done with this.' "'With all my heart,' answered she. "'Then why do you persecute us any longer? "'Leave poor Clifford and me in peace. "'Neither of us deserves anything better.' "'It is my purpose to see Clifford before I leave this house,' continued the judge. "'Do not act like a madwoman, Hepzibah. "'I am his only friend and an all-powerful one. "'Has it never occurred to you, you are so blind as not to have seen, "'that without not merely my consent but my efforts, my representations, "'the exertion of my whole influence, political, official, personal,' "'Clifford would never have been what you call free? "'Did you think his release a triumph over me? Ha <laughs> not so, my good cousin, not so by any means. "'The furthest possible from that. "'No, but it was the accomplishment of a purpose "'long entertained on my part. "'I set him free.' "'You,' answered Hepzibah, "'I never will believe it. "'He owed his dungeon to you, his freedom to God's providence. "'I set him free,' reaffirmed Judge Pynchon, "'with the calmness composure. "'And I come hither now to decide whether he shall retain his freedom. "'It will depend upon himself. "'For this purpose I must see him.' "'Never. It would drive him mad,' exclaimed Hepzibah. "'But with an irresoluteness sufficiently perceptible to the keen eye of the judge. For without the slightest faith in his good intentions, she knew not whether there was most to dread in yielding or resistance. And why should you wish to see this wretched, broken man who retains hardly a fraction of his intellect and will hide even that from an eye which has no love in it? He shall see love enough in mine, if that be all, said the judge, with well-grounded confidence in the benignity of his aspect. "'But, Cousin Hepzibah, you confess a great deal and very much to the purpose. "'Now listen, and I will frankly explain my reasons for insisting on this interview. "'At the death, thirty years since, of our Uncle Jaffrey, it was found. "'I know not whether the circumstance ever attracted much of your attention. "'Among the sadder interests that cluttered round that event, "'but it was found that his visible estate of every kind "'fell far short of any estimate ever made of it. He was supposed to be immensely rich. Nobody doubted that he stood among the weightiest men of his day. It was one of his eccentricities, however, and not altogether a folly neither, to conceal the amount of his property by making distant and foreign investments, perhaps under other names than his own and by various means, familiar enough to capitalists, but unnecessary here to be specified. By Uncle Jeffrey's last will and testament, as you are aware, his entire property was bequeathed to me, with the single exception of a life interest to yourself in this old family mansion and the strip of patrimonial estate remaining attached to it. "'And do you seek to deprive us of that?' asked Hepzibah, unable to restrain her bitter contempt. "'Is this your price for ceasing to persecute poor Clifford?' 
Certainly not, my dear cousin, answered the judge, smiling benevolently. On the contrary, as you must do me the justice to own, I have constantly expressed my readiness to double or treble your resources. Whenever you should make up your mind to accept any kindness of that nature at the hands of your kinsmen. No, no, but here lies the gist of the matter. Of my uncle's unquestionably great estate, as I have said, not the half, no, not one third, as I am fully convinced, was apparent after his death. Now I have the best possible reasons for believing that your brother Clifford can give me a clue to the recovery of the remainder. Clifford? <laughs> Clifford, know of any hidden wealth? Clifford, have it in his power to make you rich? cried the old gentlewoman, affected with a sense of something like ridicule at the idea. Impossible! You deceive yourself. It is really a thing to laugh at. It is as certain as that I stand here, said Judge Pynchon, striking his gold-headed cane on the floor and at the same time stamping his foot as if to express his conviction the more forcibly by the whole emphasis of his substantial person. Clifford told me so himself. No, no, exclaimed Hepzibah incredulously. You are dreaming, Cousin Jaffrey. I do not belong to the dreaming class of men, said the judge quietly. Some months before my uncle's death, Clifford boasted to me of the possession of the secret of incalculable wealth. His purpose was to taunt me and excite my curiosity. I knew it well, but from a pretty distinct recollection of the particulars of our conversation, I am thoroughly convinced that there was truth in what he said. Clifford, at this moment, if he chooses, and choose he must, can inform me where to find the schedule, the documents, the evidences, in whatever shape they exist, of the vast amount of Uncle Jaffrey's missing property. He has the secret... His boast was no idle word. It had a directness, an emphasis, a particularity that showed a backbone of solid meaning within the mystery of his expression. But what could have been Clifford's object, asked Hepzibah, in concealing it so long? It was one of the bad impulses of our fallen nature, replied the judge, turning up his eyes. He looked upon me as his enemy. He considered me as the cause of his overwhelming disgrace, his imminent peril of death, his irretrievable ruin. There was no great probability, therefore, of his volunteering information out of his dungeon that should elevate me still higher on the ladder of prosperity. But the moment has now come when he must give up his secret. And what if he should refuse? inquired Hepzibah. Or, as I steadfastly believe, what if he has no knowledge of this wealth? My dear cousin, said Judge Pynchon, with a quietude which he had the power of making more formidable than any violence. Since your brother's return, I have taken the precaution, a highly proper one in the near kinsman and natural guardian of an individual so situated, to have his deportment and habits constantly and carefully overlooked. "'Your neighbors have been eyewitnesses "'to whatever has passed in the garden. "'The butcher, the baker, the fishmonger, "'some of the customers of your shop, "'and many a prying old woman "'have told me several of the secrets of your interior. "'A still larger circle, I myself among the rest, "'can testify to his extravagances at the arched window. Thousands beheld him a week or two ago "'on the point of flinging himself thence into the street.' From all this testimony I am led to apprehend, reluctantly and with deep grief, that Clifford's misfortunes have so affected his intellect, never very strong, that he cannot safely remain at large. The alternative, you must be aware, and its adoption will depend entirely on the decision which I am now about to make. The alternative is his confinement, probably for the remainder of his life in a public asylum for persons in his unfortunate state of mind. You cannot mean it, shrieked Hepzibah. Should my cousin Clifford, continued Judge Pynchon, wholly undisturbed, from mere malice and hatred of one whose interests ought naturally to be dear to him, 
a mood of passion that, as often as any other, indicates mental disease. Should he refuse me the information so important to myself and which he assuredly possesses, I shall consider it the one needed jot of evidence to satisfy my mind of his insanity. And once sure of the course pointed out by conscience, you know me too well, Cousin Hepzibah, to entertain a doubt that I shall pursue it. Oh, Jaffrey, Cousin Jaffrey, cried Hepzibah, mournfully, not passionately. It is you that are diseased in mind, not Clifford. You have forgotten that a woman was your mother, that you have had sisters, brothers, children of your own, or that there ever was affection between man and man, or pity from one man to another in this miserable world. Else, how could you have dreamed of this? You are not young, Cousin Jaffrey, no, nor middle-aged, but already an old man. The hair is white upon your head. How many years have you to live? Are you not rich enough for that little time? Shall you be hungry? Shall you lack clothes or a roof to shelter you between this point in the grave? No, but with the half of what you now possess, you could revel in costly food and wines and build a house twice as splendid as you now inhabit and make a far greater show to the world and yet leave riches to your only son to make him bless the hour of your death. Then why should you do this cruel, cruel thing, so mad a thing that I know not whether to call it wicked? Oh, alas, Cousin Jaffrey, this hard and grasping spirit has run in our blood these two hundred years. You are but doing it over again in another shape, what your ancestor before you did, and sending down to your posterity the curse inherited from him. "'Talk sense, Hepzibah, for heaven's sake!' exclaimed the judge, with the impatience natural to a reasonable man on hearing anything so utterly absurd as the above in a discussion about matters of business. "'I have told you my determination. I am not apt to change. Clifford must give up his secret or take the consequences, and let him decide quickly, for I have several affairs to attend to this morning and an important dinner engagement with some political friends.' "'Clifford has no secret,' answered Hepzibah, "'and God will not let you do the thing you meditate. "'We shall see,' said the unmoved judge. "'Meanwhile, choose whether you will summon Clifford "'and allow this business to be amicably settled "'by an interview between two kinsmen, "'or drive me to harsher measures, "'which I should be most happy to feel myself justified in avoiding. "'The responsibility is altogether on your part.' "'You are stronger than I,' said Hepzibah, after a brief consideration, "'and you have no pity in your strength. "'Clifford is not now insane, "'but the interview which you insist upon may go far to make him so. "'Nevertheless, knowing you as I do, "'I believe it to be my best course "'to allow you to judge for yourself "'as to the improbability of his possessing any valuable secret.' I will call Clifford. Be merciful in your dealings with him. Be far more merciful than your heart bids you be, for God is looking at you, Jaffrey Pinchon. The judge followed his cousin from the shop, where the foregoing conversation had passed into the parlor and flung himself heavily into the great ancestral chair. Many a former Pinchon had found repose in its capacious arms. Rosy children, after their sports, Young men, dreamy with love, grown men, weary with cares, old men, burthened with winters. They had mused and slumbered and departed to a yet profounder sleep. It had been a long tradition, though a doubtful one, that this was the very chair seated in which the earliest of the judge's New England forefathers, he whose picture still hung upon the wall, had given a dead man's silent and stern reception to the throng of distinguished guests. From that hour of evil omen until the present, it may be, though we know not the secret of his heart, but it may be that no wearier and sadder man had ever sunk into the chair than this same Judge Pynchon, whom we must have just beheld so immitigably hard and resolute. Surely it must have been at no slight cost 
that he had thus fortified his soul with iron. Such calmness is a mightier effort than the violence of weaker men, and there was yet a heavy task for him to do. Was it a little matter, a trifle to be prepared for in a single moment, and to be rested from in another moment, that he must now, after thirty years, encounter a kinsman risen from a living tomb and wrench a secret from him, or else consign him to a living tomb again? Did you speak? asked Hepzibah, looking in from the threshold of the parlor, for she imagined that the judge had uttered some sound which she was anxious to interpret as a relenting impulse. I thought you called me back. No, no, gruffly answered Judge Pynchon with a harsh frown while his brow grew almost a black purple in the shadow of the room. Why should I call you back? Time flies. Bid Clifford come to me. The judge had taken his watch from his vest pocket and now held it in his hand, measuring the interval which was to ensue before the appearance of Clifford. The end of chapter 15. Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go 